Today we're tackling a topic that's uh, pretty relevant, I think you'd agree, um, especially now. We're talking about information networks. And to help us unpack all of this, we're joined by our oh. expert. We're diving into Yuval Noah Harari's new book. It's called Nexus, a brief history of information networks from the Stone Age to AI. So are you ready to maybe have some of your assumptions challenged? Because I know I was when I was reading this one. Harari's basic argument is that, you know, information isn't just about like knowing facts, right? It's more about the narratives, the stories that we tell and share and how those actually end up shaping how we view the world. And so he actually presents these three different perspectives on information. It's kind of like, um, I don't know if this is the right analogy, but like looking at an object through a bunch of different colored lenses mm -hmm. and they all kind of give you a different perspective on that same information. Yeah. So he starts off with what he calls the naive view. And this is basically the idea that like the more information you get, especially if it's accurate, the better decisions you're going to make. So like think about medical breakthroughs, right? Those often come from having more data, more research. Exactly. But then Harari, he kind of throws a curveball. He introduces this idea of the populist view. And the populist view is basically all about power. It's less about, you know, truth and more about controlling the narrative, controlling what people see and hear. And he even argues that this often involves, you know, kind of exploiting people's existing biases or fears. Right. It's about manipulating people more than it is about getting to the truth. Yeah, exactly. And then just when you thought it couldn't get any more complex, he hits us with the complex view. Right. And this perspective kind of combines those first two. It acknowledges that both truth and D, these shared beliefs that we have, they both play a role in shaping our reality. And this is where it gets really interesting because he argues that sometimes false information or at least, you know, information that's not objectively true can actually be really effective at creating a sense of order or unity. Right. It's like the power of a good story. Yeah. Can you give us an example of that? Like, how can false information create order? Well, let's take religion, for example. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of religious texts, they have stories that, you know, they might not necessarily hold up to, like scientific rigor, but, you know, they've provided this framework for morality and for building communities for centuries. Ah, uh, like, so it's like, even if the story isn't technically true, the power of that shared belief, it can be a really powerful unifying force. Okay. Exactly. And it's not just religion either. Mm -hmm. um, think about nations, right? Those are essentially lines that we've drawn on a map but we've imbued them with so much meaning and they hold these populations together. Yeah. Or even something like money. Money only has value because we all agree that it does. It's true. It's just paper, right? Right. These are all examples of what Harari calls shared fictions. They might not be true in the strictest sense, but they allow us to cooperate and build these complex societies. So you're saying that sometimes a little bit of shared illusion, I guess you could say, can be helpful. Yeah, even necessary. For societies to function. Exactly. And that's key to understanding why, when it comes to governing large groups of people, order is often more important than like pure objective truth. Because it's much easier to maintain control if everyone's on the same page, even if that page is maybe, you know, a little bit fabricated. A little bit of a white lie to hold everything together. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we've got these different ways of looking at information. The naive pursuit of truth, the strategic use of information for power, and this this complex interplay of truth and these shared beliefs that may or may not be true. How do these ideas actually play out in the real world throughout history and even today? That's what we're going to be exploring as we dive deeper into Nexus. So we're talking about shared narratives and how they can be powerful for, you know, building societies, but also for like maintaining power. Right. And this actually uh, this reminds me of a story that Harari tells about Stalin. Apparently Stalin's son, Vasily, he tried to pull that classic, do you know who my dad is? And just, you know, demanded some uh, preferential treatment, which I guess isn't all that surprising for a dictator's kid. Right. Yeah, it sounds about right. But get this. When Vasily like threw a tantrum and yelled, I am Stalin. Stalin immediately shut him down. He said, you are not Stalin. Even I am not Stalin. Stalin is Soviet power. Wow. I know, right? That's that's kind of chilling when you think about it. It really is. And it just goes to show how even dictators who seemingly have all this power, they're still ultimately reliant on these narratives, these carefully constructed images. It's like their power comes from the idea of them, not necessarily like who they are as a person. Yeah, almost like the emperor's new clothes, but like on a much larger, more... Uh, more terrifying. Yeah, exactly. A much more terrifying scale. And, you know, this whole idea of relying on these carefully crafted narratives, it kind of brings us to another key player in this whole information game. Bureaucracy. Ah, yes, bureaucracy. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we often think of bureaucracy as this, you know, 
kind of a drag. Right. All that paperwork and red tape, nobody's favorite thing. Exactly. But how does it actually fit into this larger picture of information networks? Well, think about it this way. As societies become more complex, relying solely on, like, shared stories or, you know, oral traditions, that just doesn't cut it anymore. You need a system to keep track of everything. Exactly. You need these systems to manage information, to keep records, to, you know, standardize procedures. Imagine trying to run a modern government or a huge company just based on word of mouth. Oh, yeah, right. It would be total chaos. Total chaos. Exactly. So bureaucracy with all of its flaws, it brings this level of order that you need, especially when you're dealing with that level of complexity. Okay, that makes sense. But then doesn't that create its own set of problems? Like we love to put things into these neat little boxes, but the world is rarely that simple. That is the big danger. And it's something Harari talks about. Yeah. He uses this thought experiment called the ugly duckling theorem. The ugly duckling theorem. Yeah. And it basically says, any two things. They share an infinite number of similarities, but also an infinite number of differences. So trying to categorize everything, it becomes really arbitrary. Can you give us an example of that? Like, how does that actually play out? Sure. Think about how we categorize a tomato. Is it a fruit or is it a vegetable? Hmm. I've never thought about that. Right. We cook with it like a vegetable. Right. But technically, it's a fruit. And so this just illustrates how the categories we use they're often just tools that we create. They don't necessarily reflect some kind of absolute truth. So what happens when those categories, those systems become too rigid, too resistant to change? That's the danger of any system that prioritizes order above all else. You know, when information flow is controlled, when there's no room for dissent, when the system is more concerned with, you know, just holding on to power than actually adapting, that's when you get stagnation, corruption, and eventually the whole thing collapses. So we've talked about these systems of order, like how bureaucracies, they can get kind of stuck, right? Like mm. too rigid, not able to change when they need to. So what's the alternative? Like how do you create a system that has order but is also flexible? That's, that's the question, isn't it? And Harari, he points out how systems that are based on these unchanging truths, you know, like a lot of religious doctrines, they often run into trouble when it comes to adapting to new information or changing circumstances. Right, because it's like trying to force a square peg into a round hole. Eventually, something's got to give. Exactly. And history's full of these examples where these systems, they end up fracturing, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes violently because people are trying to figure out how to interpret these unchanging truths in a world that just keeps changing. Right, right. So can you give us an example of that? Like what happens when those unchanging truths bump up against reality? Sure. Harari talks about this thing called the Taiping Rebellion. It happened in 19th century China. And there was this one figure, Yang Zhuking, who claimed he was possessed by God. Hmm. And he used that authority to like issue decrees even to punish the leader of this rebellion. Wow, really? Yeah. And at first it actually worked. It kind of held the movement together. OK. But then his pronouncements, they got more and more erratic and he created chaos. And eventually it led to this huge internal conflict that really weakened the rebellion. So even a system that's based on, you know, what people believe is divine truth, it can still go off the rails if it's too rigid, too inflexible. Right. Exactly. So then what's a better way? How do you build a system that's actually built for change? Well, this is where Harari contrasts those religious doctrines with the scientific method. Mm -hmm. Because the scientific method, it has this built-in mechanism for self-correction. Right, because science is all about questioning your assumptions, being willing to admit when you're wrong. It's a process, right? Exactly. You don't just stop and say, okay, we've got all the answers. You keep testing, keep experimenting. Exactly. And it's that willingness to be wrong, that constant questioning, that actually drives progress. You're always refining your understanding, getting a little bit closer to the truth, but you're always open to the idea that you might not have the whole picture. Okay, that makes sense. So it's not just about having more information. It's about how that information is generated yeah. and shared and questioned, which kind of makes me think about the printing press, right? That was a huge deal for the spread of information, wasn't it? Absolutely. It was a total game changer. Suddenly you could mass produce information, spread it way further than ever before. But like any tool, it could be used for, you know, good or bad. Exactly. I mean, it also led to the spread of misinformation, propaganda, all of that. Right. And on a much larger scale. So it's like this age old battle for the narrative. But now it's being fought with like a whole new arsenal. Exactly. And here we are now, right, in the age of the Internet, social media, AI. 
it seems like that battle for the narrative, it's just gotten even more intense. It definitely has and more complex. So where do we even go from here? Well, before we, you know, descend into total techno dystopia, we have developed systems for dealing with disagreement, with the complexities of information. We've already touched on it, actually. Yeah. It's democracy. OK, right. Democracy. But we tend to think of it as just majority rules. Yeah, yeah. but it's more than that. OK. At its heart. Democracy is a system for managing this constant flow of new information. Yeah. All these different viewpoints, this messy process of figuring things out as we go. So it's like one giant public debate. Exactly. And crucial to that debate are things like freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to assemble. These safeguards that prevent any one group or ideology from controlling the whole conversation. So if information is power, then democracy is about distributing that power. Exactly. Making sure there are different voices, different perspectives, and a system that can actually adapt to new information. Precisely. So where does that leave us? Like, what does this all mean for us just trying to navigate this world that seems to get more complex every day? Well, Harari, he talks about the importance of what he calls informed skepticism. Okay, informed skepticism. So what does that mean? Basically, it means being willing to question what you see and hear. Consider different points of view. Don't just take things at face value. Don't just accept blindly. Right, yeah. exactly. You gotta be able to tell the difference between trust and blind faith. Like being like a detective of information, right? You're looking for clues, trying to put the pieces together, figure out the truth. Exactly. That's actually a pretty good analogy. Well, on that note, to all of our listeners out there, next time you find yourself scrolling through a million headlines, or just grappling with like a complicated issue, just remember the ability to think for yourself, to question what you see and hear, that might be more important now than ever. So stay curious, stay informed, and we'll catch you next time for another deep dive. You guys seem really fascinated by this whole AI thing. Like, where does it all go from here? You know, we're diving into Yuval Noah Harari's nexus today. And wow, you all had a lot to say about it. Yeah, Harari really gets the gears turning, doesn't he? No kidding. Mm -hmm. And he's not just some historian telling us old stories, right? So he's looking at the really big picture of technology. He's all about those long-term trends. Right. Like what happens when new tech comes along and shakes everything up? And how does that play out with AI? He's definitely sounding the alarm bells, especially about the power of information. Whoever controls the flow of information controls a lot more than just data. Think about it. From ancient empires to the printing press, right up to social media today. It's true. Those who control the information kind of control the game. Exactly. And Harari's point is, AI is about to become a major player in these networks. And we might not be ready for the consequences. OK, so get this. Imagine you're in Stalinist Russia at one of those super intense rallies. Everyone's clapping for Stalin, obviously. Can't stop clapping, right? Right. And nobody wants to be the first one to stop, you know, for obvious reasons. Yeah, you don't want to stand out in that situation. Exactly. So the clapping just goes on and on. Everyone's arms are killing them. Finally, this one factory manager, he's just had enough. He sits down. And of course, as soon as he does, everyone else follows suit. They were all probably thinking the same thing. Right. But guess who gets punished for it? Let me guess. The factory manager who dared to stop first. You got it. Even though everyone was relieved, he's the one who gets in trouble. Talk about a no-win situation. Totally. And that's exactly what Harari uses to illustrate the potential danger here. It's like the goal wasn't endless clapping, but the system rewarded it anyway. And his fear is that AI could end up doing something similar, but on a much larger scale. It's the law of unintended consequences, right? You set out to do one thing, but the system itself creates these weird, often harmful outcomes. And that kind of brings us to what we call the alignment problem in AI. Like, we can program AI to be super efficient, but how do we make sure it's actually aligned with what we want as humans? It's tougher than it sounds right, because what we say we want and what we actually do, they don't always line up. That's putting it mildly. Think of Napoleon, right? Yeah. Brilliant military mind, conquered most of Europe. But his victories actually ended up strengthening the very nations that would later challenge France. So even Napoleon, with all his ambition and strategy, couldn't escape those unintended consequences. Not even close. And AI is like that, but on steroids. It can optimize for things in ways we can't even imagine, which can be amazing or terrifying, depending on how well we've aligned it with our values. And how do you even begin to align something as complex as AI with something as, well, messy as human values? That's 
the million dollar question. And it's something we'll definitely be unpacking more as we dive deeper into this. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I'm just along for the ride with all this tech stuff, you know, like, are we really in control here? I get it. It's easy to feel that way. But the discussion around Harari's book gets even more interesting here. Some experts think he might be missing something really important. Yeah. Like what? Human nature. Okay, I'm listening. So there's this other book, Not Born Yesterday, by Hugo Mercier. You might find it fascinating. Mercier's argument is that humans are way harder to manipulate than we often think. Huh. I feel like we fall for all kinds of stuff, like clickbait and those targeted ads. Sure, but Mercier says we have this built-in skepticism, especially when someone's trying to tell us what to think or how to act. He even uses Nazi Germany as an example. Whoa, okay, that seems like a pretty extreme example. It is, but think about it. The Nazis controlled pretty much all the information, right? Propaganda yeah. everywhere. But they still couldn't convince everyone of everything. So even with all that pressure, people still pushed back. They had their own values, their own experiences. They weren't just going to abandon those, even under Nazi rule. For example, Nazi propaganda was really effective when it came to promoting existing anti-Semitism, but it largely backfired when they tried to get the public on board with euthanizing people with disabilities. The people drew the line somewhere. Exactly. We're not just robots taking orders, even when those orders are coming from a powerful AI. Okay, that makes me think about how even those super smart Hollywood algorithms can't always predict which movies will be hits. We're just too complex, right? Mm. Our tastes change, sometimes for no reason. That's a great point. We're not just passive consumers of information. We're filtering, we're interpreting. And yeah, sometimes we just flat out reject what's being thrown at us. We have agency and AI, at least not yet, can't fully grasp that. So we're not talking about some Hollywood doomsday scenario where robots become self-aware and turn on us. No, not exactly. Even the stuff we've been reading acknowledges that might be a bit over the top, you know? Like AI isn't going full Terminator anytime soon. Not that we know of. The reality is AI is more of a reflection of us than some independent force. Right, it's like that saying, garbage in, garbage out. If we train AI on biased data, it's going to be biased. A hundred percent. So it's not about AI becoming sentient. It's about us using this powerful tool responsibly. And figuring out what we even mean by responsibly, because that can mean different things to different people, right? Absolutely. And that's what makes this conversation so crucial. It's not just about the tech itself, but about our values, mm. our choices. Exactly. And one thing that really struck me is how AI could be used to strengthen both democratic and authoritarian systems. Like, it's not inherently one or the other. It's a tool, right. Uh, a hammer can build a house or it can, well, do some damage. Right. In a democracy, you could use AI to make information more transparent, fight misinformation. Make things fairer, maybe. Exactly. But in the wrong hands. It could be used to control people even more. Sadly, that's the flip side. It's like AI takes what's already there and amplifies it, for better or worse. So where does that leave us? It feels like a lot to wrap our heads around. It is, but that's why we do these deep dives, right? To break it down together. And I think if you take away anything from today, it's these three things. One, AI is a tool. It's not magic. It's not destiny. It's a product of human ingenuity. And that means we have a say in how it's used. We're not just along for the ride, right? Right. Two, critical thinking is more important now than ever. Don't believe everything you hear about AI even, or maybe especially from the experts. Ask questions look for different points of view, and stay informed. Don't just hit that like button without really thinking about it, right? Exactly. And finally, never forget that you have a voice in this. You can help shape the future of AI, whether it's the choices you make, the conversations you have, or by demanding more ethical and transparent development from the people building these systems. So what you're saying is we're not powerless here. We have agency. We absolutely do. And that brings me to a question I think everyone listening should ponder. If the biggest danger isn't AI becoming self-aware and taking over, but how it interacts with our own very human tendencies towards tribalism and us versus them thinking, well, that changes things, doesn't it? What does that mean for how we approach the future? How do we want to shape that future? Something to think about. It definitely is. Wow. Lots to chew on today. But that's all the time we have for today's Deep Dive. Don't stop exploring these ideas. Keep those questions coming, and we'll see you next time.